Welcome back. Here we are at part two, uh, and we're going to take our look at colour a little bit further. I mentioned Johann Goethe uh, right at the beginning of part one, um, and um, I think this is a good point now to turn to Goethe's work and just have a little peek. Uh, what makes him so profoundly different in his interpretation of colour uh, to, um, to Newton's very physical science-y uh, approach. Um, and again, as I said in part one, Goethe's work, when it was translated, became something of a favourite of J.M.W. Turner. Uh, and you can see the effect of Goethe's philosophy of colour uh, in Turner's paintings, and I'll try and pull out a couple of examples as we go through. Now, Goethe disagreed with Newton's approach, he disagreed quite profoundly. And in Goethe's case, um, he started by looking closely at the boundaries between things, so particularly the boundaries between light and dark. Uh, and some of the examples I'm going to show you, actually photographed in, in this very room, just rely on looking at the colours that are coming um, to our eyes from the edge of a window pane, for instance. So next to uh, the wooden window jam, for instance, the frame. Um, and we'll see that actually that makes a, makes a big difference to what we observe. So boundaries. Boundaries were key. To Goethe. That's the point I'm really trying to stress. So we're going to have a look at a few um, slides now which will basically conduct some experiments with our perceptions of colour and what we see. Uh, so I'm going to show you um, three or four slides now and the essence of this is that you simply stare at them for a while. OK, so even if it means pausing the video so that you get time for your eyes uh, to relax uh, into, these, uh, into these pictures. So you're not particularly focusing in any one place. You're, you're um, allowing yourself to gaze fixedly uh, at the slide that's going, into, uh, going to be presented to you. So this first one's just going to be a set of um, squares, block um, block squares on the slide and as I say gaze at it and then remember what it is you perceive uh, to be in the spaces between the corners of these blocks of colour. So here we go. Now what you see will depend a little bit on the sort of screen that you've got um, the bigger the screen, the better. But what I hope you perceive as you gaze at this slide is that in all those bits between the corners, it will appear as though uh, there is a small square of grey. Uh, and this is a fairly... Um, A fairly standard sort of um, slide to show. It's it's a very easy demonstration or an easy way into uh, what um, Goethe was getting at. So all these little locations here like these uh, you'll begin to see the longer you stare at it a little square sometimes you might your eyeball might tell you it's actually a more like a circle of grey just sat in those points there. OK, so this is our first simple demonstration of what Goethe was going on about, that actually the, between dark and light, uh, your eye actually perceives something to be. Uh, and his, his very, very careful observations, I mean, he spent years doing this, um, focus very much on what it is we actually see, so what we perceive, in other words. Um, now, you might again need to pause the video between each of these because unfortunately our retinas have a sort of memory of what they've seen so you might still be seeing a grid in front of your eyes in which case do pause it, 
let your eyes rest uh, for a minute and then come back in again. But what I want you to look at now um, is slides that are going to have um, basically two colours on them. So there's going to be one colour in a wide outer border and I want you to gaze at the entire screen and fix in your mind, remember, uh, what it is you perceive in the central part of the slide. So there's going to be a sort of rectangle in the middle and I want you to just you know, have a look at that for, for a few seconds. So here's our first one and you'll notice the, uh, the background here is, is red, very bright red. Um, what is the colour that's hinted at in that central rectangle? Okay, so again, after you've looked at this, give your eyes a rest. It's very hard for your retina sometimes to forget what it is they've just been looking at. But when you're ready, try this one. So we have a green now as the background. Um, tell me what you see in the middle. Tell yourself, I should say, what you see in the middle. You can see I'm still harping back to face-to-face um, -face meetings with people. Um, Hopefully this will work for you. Okay, so we're out of it now. Um, this is just to demonstrate to you that that central bit for both the red and the green background was a simple neutral grey colour. But I think what you might have noticed is that in here with the green you saw something that was you know sort of magenta-ish maybe reddish whereas on this one you might have caught a hint of uh, a bluey green in the middle this will vary a little bit from person to person but our eyes are telling us that this shape in the middle here is not grey it's actually something different and that's important. So here it is, expanded. Uh, this is the this is the colour that was there all along. And we can see this in in practice. I mean, this is a lighting rig in um, St Mary Bread and Church in Canterbury, which is a location where a lot of U three A um, sessions take place. And there's a sort of you know a pinky stroke magenta spotlight that's being shone up the wall there. And so the lighting beam here casts a shadow on the roof above. And you'll notice, I think, that this shadow has a sort of greeny tinge to it. Well, there's no source of green light uh, in the vicinity at all, but our eyes are seeing something that's green. This wall actually is a sort of yellow colour. You can, you can see it in the window recess there. Uh, it's just got this red light shining up and here we are creating a shadow on what is a white ceiling. Um, and our eyes are telling us that that's actually a, a sort of greeny colour. And these are the sort of observations that Goethe undertook all the time and did so very, very carefully uh, and contributed enormously to our understanding of the perception of colour. So if I zoom in on this bit on the ceiling here, you can quite distinctly see this. This, to the eye, this doesn't look white at all. Um, and out of this, Goethe produced um, a colour wheel. So this is a, a rendition of his original colour wheel. And he was pulling from this what we now understand as complementary colours. So complementary to the red end of the spectrum is this sort of green or bluey green colours over here. Complementary to yellow is blue and so on and so forth. As we move around um, this colour wheel of the different colours that he was observing, he's now showing us what he would expect to see in that rectangle in the middle 
in other words. Our eyes produce for us in the brain uh, the complementary colour to the dominant one around. When you, you know, I'm not advising this uh, as a full-time occupation, uh, but if you look at the sun for a couple of seconds and then close your eyes, my guess is, the sun being bright yellow, that what you see on the inside of your eyelids is actually a blue colour, the complementary colour to the yellow. And this all came out of Goethe's really careful observations back in the 18th century. And we've just done a very some very simple experiments to demonstrate you know where he got these ideas from his close observations but there's even more we can do but let's have a look first at the whole idea of color wheels this goethe inspired um complementary color package as it were um is is universal now so these actually are not color wheels these are actually two sides of a sphere, actually a colour sphere. So you can go, um, you know, on a diameter, as it were, all the way through this sphere from any um, hue of a particular colour to its complement on the other side, for instance. And our traditional colour wheel is actually just a slice through the middle of this sphere. So this is the sort of thing that you will see presented as a modern version of Goethe's colour wheel uh, and as I say it is just a slice through the middle of, of, the, of the sphere. So we can see our complementary colours right this one has its complement over here this one has its complement over here. So stare at this colour exclusively for a period of time and close your eyes uh, what you will see on the inside of your eyelids um, is this colour more likely than not. It's complement. We can find colour wheels of course uh, all over the place now. They're very readily available online and physical form so you know this sort of thing that you can get from um, you know paint manufacturers and deco decorators and so on you know which shows you how you can add different colours and get different combinations and so on but on the reverse side um, here for instance this bold arrow going through the centre is showing us once again the complementary colours. So this is a fairly simple little handheld device that will um, give you exactly the sort of information that I've um, been illustrating in the slides um, hitherto. So you know, here's our bold line going across showing us the complementary colours. So, you know, the inner ring goes to the inner ring over here, the outer ring through to the outer ring. Um, and again, it's it's the same sort of stuff as, as, you know, looking at a bright light, shutting your eyes and then, you know, what is it you see on the inside of your eyelid, as it were, what's uh, what's left? Uh, that's the complementary colour, that is your brain filling in uh, what it perceives to be missing uh, from the setup. So there we are, complementary colours came out of, um, out of the work done by Johann Goethe. Well, we can, we can do more. Uh, this is actually uh, I think this is the same, maybe it's a couple of different restaurants on Canterbury High Street. So this is from the days, uh, obviously, before the dreaded um, coronavirus. And I got a few strange looks from the staff, but I did explain to them what I was doing. And once they understood that I was replicating some of the work of Johann Goethe, they were, of course, more than happy to let me um, take a few shots of window frames. Um, and you'll notice something really quite stark here. Uh, these are window frames being reflected in a mirror on the wall of the restaurant, which have beveled edges. So these act like a prism, in other words. So we're going to get refraction going on. Uh, but look what we've got here. Around this frame of the window, 
we don't have colors that go um, you know red orange yellow green right all the way through to, to violet it's it's quite quite different we have red going through orange to yellow going out in that direction but we have the blue end of the spectrum actually traveling out at that part so we've actually we seem to have split it down the middle and moved the halves across each other right and it's the same on this uh, this vertical over here it happens on horizontal lines as well right you can see where I'm going here we've we've, we've highlighted the fact that Goethe was interested in this division between dark and light so window frames produce a, an ideal vehicle uh, for his experiments if we look at the horizontal for instance and again this is reflected in in uh, this bevel edged mirror uh, you can see we get exactly the same thing at the bottom we get the reds oranges and yellows and at the top uh, we get um, you know indigo violet blue um, so you know next time you're in a position to have a look for this sort of stuff um, do because it's absolutely fascinating and this is this is exactly the sort of observation that Goethe was basing his work on and in fact in um, situations like this we actually get colors that don't even appear in the colors of the rainbow that Newton defined for us through the prism so we'll get magenta appearing as a color in this setup we don't get magenta in the rainbow colors so where is it coming from uh, I tried this in my study as well this is um, this is my perspex prism again but looking at the uprights in my window frame and in fact you can see it on the rooftops uh, outside as well and we exactly the same thing look uh, we've got one part of the spectrum there another part of the spectrum on the other side of the vertical it's exactly the same with the horizontals right exactly the same so Goethe discovered something really quite amazing actually when he was doing his observations um, and this is stuff that actually Newton didn't spend any time on uh, it wasn't a thing for him he was doing a different sort of experiment so you know we go back to this these verticals again you know here's a piece of wood in the window frame um, so going in this direction as I say the red end of the spectrum if we go to the other side of the window pane we've got indigos violets and so on going into blues try it I mean all you need as I say is something that will behave like a prism for you so up or down left or right as in those window frames uh, we get these peculiar color formations happening um, how is that consistent with what Newton did does it disagree with it altogether does it throw it out the window did Newton get it wrong or did he miss a trick um, well we'll have a look at that as we go through but uh, the key thing is that out of Goethe's work we get as I say we get this whole thing about complementary colors uh, but we also get the emotions that we attach to colors Goethe was you know very strong on, on that sort of interpretation so we get warm colors and cold colors and so on concepts like that uh, will um, come from from Goethe's thinking and he's essentially he's looking at um, you know warm colors on this side of my dark light boundary cool colors on this side of my dark white boundary a dark light boundary I beg your pardon um, so linking colors to concepts like warm and cold very quickly gets into us linking colors with emotions for instance and this is where um, JMW Turner comes in I hasten to add that um, this is not a picture of his original uh, rain steam and speed uh, this is actually a, uh, a painting 
uh, done by my wife in acrylic uh, based on Turner's painting but you know I rather like it um, and it shows the same sort of effects but this is a point at which Turner has taken Goethe's thinking to heart so he's actually now choosing colours in his paintings to represent uh, emotions to represent uh, senses so in here he's thinking about excitement and power um, and um, you know he's quite happy then to use lots of lots of, of reds and oranges and yellows and so on but he's thrown other colors in complementary colors into this mix um, in order to pick out uh, discord um, he was fairly clear in his mind the advent of, of steam power was not only a very exciting and in, in many senses a beautiful thing, but actually would profoundly change society and the way that people uh, people lived. Uh, it's not all going to be, um, you know, warm colours, um, power and excitement uh, in, in his interpretation. It's also going to be highly disruptive. And we can go on with uh, with Turner's paintings um, here also. So now you know. Let's let's follow this line of thinking um, of Turner's further. These are a pair of paintings. Um, it's um, one of them is is you know this is all to do with the with the flood, all right. So it, it's it's. Um, the stories that Moses wrote uh, in the um, in the book of Genesis but he's using colors here to convey chaos and disorder and order coming out of that chaos so we can see fairly um, um, fairly clearly here the difference between these two look we've got we've almost got a color wheel going on over here for instance uh, and we have over here as well but um, the shades of colors are completely different uh, in these and this is quite an interesting one as well because it picks out now uh, again, you know, this is something that Goethe observed um, closely and described very carefully. The fact that shadows seldom look grey um, or a toned down version of, of, you know, what was there um, when it was uh, brightly illuminated. So, for instance, the shadow on the side of this hill here has a very distinct um, blue stroke purple colouring to it and that's actually quite important because uh, actually that is what our eyes perceive uh, we don't see the absence of this yellowy colour we see the presence of um, colours much more at the blue end of the spectrum and Turner was really good at picking this stuff out so here's another one um, and you can see again right very the shadowy part is is very much at the blue end of the spectrum and actually even its reflection in the water is shown as blue even though Turner would have known intellectually that these rocks are not blue they're actually you know the same color as these ones over here but they happen now to be in shadow uh, even the shadows of the cows and the people, you know, have this colouring associated with them as well. So he was, Turner was really good at observing the same sort of stuff that um, Goethe had observed and, and described. And artists have followed this through, um, through the, you know, the centuries since then. And you'll see a lot of paintings where um, shadows in the snow, for instance, will show up as purple in a painting. Because actually that's what our eyes perceive. If you look carefully, that's what you'll notice. So, you know, we can now think about colours in the sense that Goethe studied. 
and the sense that Turner interpreted, for instance. So, you know, what do you think about when you think about red? Do you think about warmth or do you think about danger, for instance, or yellow? You know, are we talking about jaundice or are we talking about something that's really cheerful? Um, and greens and blues and all the rest of it. And, you know, as I say, artists have, have jumped into that rabbit hole time and time again. So, you know, in the 20th century, Carl Andre, who was a, you know, a very well-known sculptor, um, came out with the sentence that I've, I've quoted on the screen here. Uh, he's essentially saying um, the same sort of thing now, but he's expanded that whole emotional uh, language out into materials. So he makes this statement that copper is more different from aluminium than green is from red. Uh, which at one level one might interpret as a nonsensical statement, but actually dwell on it for a little bit, you know, even a scientist like myself. And we come out with um, a slightly different insight into what it is uh, that we're looking at in terms of colours and indeed in terms of, of materials, the universe around us. It's allowing our perception uh, what our brain does with the signals that comes into us um, to influence our interpretations. Now, you might remember this from 2015, so, you know, we're getting on for six years ago now. Uh, this um, famous dress that broke the internet, uh, what are the colours that we're looking at? Um, you know, was it that first picture or this second picture? Um, there were all sorts of arguments raging. Social media was full of this stuff. It made it to the news on the television, for instance. Um, I mean, actually, it's all down to, to you know, how you illuminate, how you light uh, the image that you're taking. And you'll see from the background in these pictures that we've gone, we've taken the brightness up as we have stepped through right to left. Um, and that actually affects what our eyes interpret, what our brain, sorry, interprets of what our eyes uh, are picking up. Uh, it's all about perception. The dress itself hasn't changed. It's the same dress. It's just that in different lights, um, our eyes actually pick up quite different signals. So there we are, the dress that broke the internet. Um, that was its marketing shot. So, you know, our brains are, of course, telling us what we're seeing. What's happening in our eyes um, is a physical process. Light is coming in. It's hitting the cells in our retina. Um, they're producing electrical currents as a result, which are going along the optic nerves into the brain. And the brain is interpreting those signals. And we learn as we grow um, you know, what things are associated with what label uh, as we grow up. But actually we all see the world differently in terms of colour. No two of us see exactly the same thing because we have individually um, had our brains develop to interpret those signals. So, you know, we, we tend as human beings apparently mostly to see green and blue pretty much the same from one to another, not identical maybe, but pretty much the same. And, you know, there are fairly obvious uh, reasons for that. You know, as our species has developed, we've seen a lot of greens and a lot of blues. Um, so maybe that's understandable that we should do that. But pretty much everything else is interpreted slightly differently from one individual to another. So it's context dependent, uh, in other words. Well, what does that mean? Um, you know, Newton gave us some amazing physical descriptions uh, of what he observed. We're able to break things down in terms of, of wavelengths, refractive index, angles, um, you know, all that sort of stuff and put precise numbers on and measure it and remeasure it and do experiments with it 
which come out with predictable results. Um, amazing work that he did and others developed um, thereafter on the basis of his, his beginnings. But what of Goethe? Goethe actually observed things that are real in the sense that our minds tell us they're there. We perceive them. We perceive the blue shadows. Uh, we perceive the coloured shadow under that spotlight beam, for instance. Uh, we perceive the little blobs of grey between the black squares on the grid I showed you earlier. Um, our minds need, obviously, to interpret the data that's coming in in a particular sort of way. So in that sense, they're real. That is actually what we perceive. Um, well, you know, you can you can toss this around in your own heads in the meantime. I've put a few um, links into the blog. So, you know, there's one for an extended video series that somebody did on um, on Goethe's work on, on and reproducing some of his experiments. They're great videos, well worth a, a look if you're interested in that. There's lots and lots of stuff on Newton's work as well. And actually, as it turns out, we can interpret the stuff that Goethe saw. So, you know, that apparently split spectrum that we get to either side of window frames, for instance, we can interpret all of that in terms of Newton's uh, theories, simply because it is an edge. Um, you know, we get refraction of the different colours coming through window panes all across the window pane. We don't see it simply because everything adds bridges out. One overlays the other as we move across the window pane. The only place that's not true is when we get to the edge of the piece of glass, because there isn't anything off to the other side of it that's actually going to average it all out and, and, and give us what we, uh, what we see as we look through a window. It's the edges then that begin to act like prisms and we get these slightly strange effects going on. So Goethe was right. He wrote down and observed very carefully what he saw. Newton was right in the sense that all of those things can be explained in terms of uh, equations and numbers and, and calculations. So, you know, they both got their points. Um, but they come at the problem from two different angles. So one from a strictly physical sciences end, the other from a perception end. And in fact, the truth for us on a day to day basis uh, is a mixture of the two. Um, and, you know, this just makes the whole concept of colour so much richer, so much deeper. Uh, there is so much more to see and understand. So if you want to follow this up, do follow some of the links that I've put uh, into the blog post um, and think about it. That's it. We've finished. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.